morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome um, to the Our Green Future Summit. Um, and thank you all very much for being here on this snowy day. I just wanted to take a second and let everybody kind of arrive. I don't know about you, but when I have a snowy start, it's a little bit of a frantic start. I have a child, and that like everything is suddenly slower getting into the car. So just take a second and arrive in this room. We have a great program for you today. Um, we are going to start off here for about an hour, and we're going to hear from President Hanlon and each of our working group chairs, and then we're going to move past that coffee up to more coffee and food in the project lab. So there is food and coffee up there. Don't worry. You'll be, have an opportunity to refill your cup uh, and take a little bio break in that transition. Um, I wanted to start by just acknowledging where we are and acknowledging that Dartmouth College sits on land, uh, which has served as the site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people since time immemorial. The Abenaki people are the traditional caretakers of these lands, their homeland. And we remember their connection to this region and the hardships that they continue to endure. Let's take a minute and just pay our respect to the Abenaki uh, elders and indigenous inhabitants of this land, past and present, and give thanks for the opportunity to share in the bounty of this place and to protect it, which I think is particularly relevant in our work today. Uh, and to acknowledge that we are part of an ecosystem of plants and people and animals here in this place. I also wanted to just take a minute and welcome into the room the 80 or so people who are joining us online this morning. Um, we're really, really happy to be here in physical person with all of you. Uh, but we also wanted to acknowledge those who are not able to be here in physical person. Um, and we're really glad that you are able to join us as well. So we're going to be welcomed today by President Hanlon. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that he was able to join us because, as you all know, six years ago, President Hanlon initiated a similar process to this one, building off of previous sustainability planning efforts, to outline a set of ambitions for Dartmouth, from which uh, he selected a set of ambitious greenhouse gas emissions goals um, that put us on a course and helped set a foundation for where we are today. Many of you have been working on advancing Dartmouth Sustainability Initiative since 2017 when President Hanlon formally announced the uh, adoption of those goals, work that we really appreciate. And when he announced that those goals, he also formed an ambition that we would look at our goals again, look at our roadmap again every five years because we're going to get new information constantly about how we're doing, what is happening in the climate, and what we can do differently, and also how quickly we have to act. So I want to thank President Hanlon for his leadership in setting the stage for Dartmouth to move um, forward as a sustainability and climate leader, and for challenging us to continue to work on this, to not be one, kind of one and done on this topic, but continue to evolve and continue to kind of improve our sustainability fitness as we move forward. Um, President Hanlon has also been a champion of experiential education on campus, and I think that's a place where um, sustainability and the student experience, the mission of the college, really come together. So there are students in this room who are working on this process. There are students who've graduated from Dartmouth who've gotten their hands dirty here, working on real sustainability challenges that then they leveraged into careers when they left Dartmouth. And we feel like that's a really important part of what we're doing, opening up our campus to have students start working here on climate change so that they can go out into the world and affect uh, change in their careers. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to President Hanlon, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Good morning. It's great to be here to kick off this culminating session of your work on the next phase of Our Green Future. And uh, it's terrific to see so many hardy northern New Englanders here in the, in the room having braved the snow. So welcome to all of you and to the people who are watching online. Um, thanks for your dedication to this important process. And I truly appreciate your time, input, and insights. And while we're giving thanks, special thanks to Rosie for everything she does on campus. 
but also for her organizing uh, this session, this, this uh, effort. So your contributions to Dartmouth's sustainability future are critical. You know, it is worth noting the progress we've made towards the goals we adopted in 2017 from the previous Our Green Future process. We've cut greenhouse gas emissions more than 30%, um, even though we moved our baseline from 2005 to 2010, just to make it a little harder. We've cut our water use by more than 35% since 2017. We completed a draft food sustainability standard. We've installed on-campus EV chargers, just to name a few of the things that have happened. And all these steps are making an impact, but there's just so much more work to be done. Our concerted efforts at Dartmouth are a subset of the work that every nation and society must undertake at this moment to protect our environment and tackle the challenges of climate change. And I think there's broad agreement that now is a critical moment. As an academic community, we believe in the power of research and teaching to make a difference in the world. And I am so proud of the historic investments we've made across the campus to promote teaching and discovery of solutions to the world's sustainability challenges. But beyond our academic work, we also have a responsibility to operate our campus as efficiently as possible and an opportunity to link the work we're doing in the classroom and the lab in the, to the ways in which we run our campus. Indeed, the establishment of the Irving Institute and the emerging body of research to which we have access, the eagerness of our students to leverage their learning to transition our campus to more sustainable practices, and the incredible number of alumni we have working in sustainability-related fields. Together, these give Dartmouth a distinct advantage in our ability to strengthen our own operations. Many of you have already made, helped make that happen. From engineering 8990 projects, like the Montgomery House Efficiency Audit, to the alumni student wildflower planting project, to the pop-up thrift, thrift stores run by sustainability interns to reduce clothing waste on campus, Students have taken on sustainability challenges, big and small, with your support. So thank you for your engagement and your commitment to this ongoing effort. The Our Green Future process was critical to setting ambitious targets in 2017, and it will be again in 2023. As you go forward, I encourage you to base your recommendations on the best science and best practice to leverage every resource on this campus available to you, and to be ambitious in your thinking. I look forward to reviewing your recommendations about how we can advance Dartmouth as a sustainability leader, and I wish you a very productive day ahead. So thank you. Thank you very much, President Hanlon, for that great introduction to kick us off. I wanted to just take a second and talk about the climate in which we're working on climate. Um, I think it's really easy right now, uh, if you care about climate and sustainability issues, to read the paper and to get pretty depressed. Um, I don't know about you, but it doesn't take far in the headlines every day for me to find a pretty depressing story about climate change. Um, however, I think that uh, some of that is because we enjoy a good, we humans enjoy a good car crash. And some of that is missing a really important point, which is that we are capable of solving for these problems. These are human problems, not environmental problems, and we are humans. We are capable of incredible things, right? We have put a man on the moon. Um, we have created this situation. We have changed the climate, which, if you think about it, is kind of a massive accomplishment. Um, and we are capable of tackling this. And there is no more important time than right now. And I don't mean that in the sense of, you know, if we don't act now, we're going up in flames. I mean that in the sense of this is the biggest opportunity we've ever had to do something awesome, right? really awesome. And the stuff we're working on makes life better for more people, right? It is about 
not only solving for climate change, but also creating communities we want to live in. Having the ability to move easily via a great transportation system, being able to breathe easily, eating delicious, healthy, local food from places that are maybe near you, grown by people that maybe you've met, right? This is an opportunity for us to actually create the kind of life that we want to lead. When I came to Dartmouth and I um, came to be the director of sustainability, I really hated that title. It's a really cool job, but I hated the title. Because I don't really wake up being like, you know what I want to do? Sustain myself, <laughs> right? I, I, I lobbied for, I was turned down, but I lobbied for being the director of Awesome. <laughs> because that's actually what we're after, right? We're after a more awesome existence on this planet during the time we have. So the opportunity in front of us today is to think about this place, Dartmouth, this place we care about, and how we can make this place more awesome. In big ways, little ways, marginal action, really bold action, but this place is the place that we get to solve this problem. So I just wanted to take a second um, and acknowledge that we have a really exciting opportunity in front of us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So what are we going to do today? Partly, we're going to understand how our work fits into the broader context of the college. Um, each of you has been working in a working group in a specific area, one of Dartmouth's six operational areas or the cross-cutting area of community. But you haven't gotten to kind of peek over the fence at what everybody else is doing. And today is your day to peek over the fence. Because of course, these, these boundaries we've set up between water and food and energy and transportation, they're artificial, right? Water is related to food. Without water, food is a lot less good, much more difficult to clean up after, right? Um, without energy, nothing at Dartmouth works, including the transportation system, the food system, the water system. So all of these areas are interconnected, and today is an opportunity for you to see what everybody else is doing and provide feedback on their draft goals and strategies. You're also going to have an opportunity to receive that feedback in your working group, and we're going to do a, a work session to start to move to action. I want to give you a little bit of an overview. You guys have seen this a million times. This is where we are. We're climbing the stairs steadily up Mount Dartmouth sustainability, right? And here we are at the summit. I want to reassure you that after, sorry, after this process, um, there's going to be a real opportunity to drive into the how we're going to do it. There's been a lot of nervousness, I think, as we've moved through this process from those of you who are responsible for doing the day-to-day -day of making Dartmouth work about having these lofty goals and strategies but how are we actually going to make them happen? Don't worry. We're going to spend a lot of time figuring out how we're going to make them happen. We're not going to just impose lofty goals and strategies uh, without figuring that out. And that's what's in meeting four. And you'll see that on another timeline as we move forward. You guys have seen these core values throughout. But I did want to remind everyone that um, these are the values that govern how we interact today. That we're going to be present. We're going to listen. We're going to assume the best and accept shared responsibility. All of you are here present, showing up to do this work, for which I thank you. Um, and that showing up means you're contributing to these solutions. And hopefully it'll be a little fun. Um, we are using these guiding questions to frame our work as we move forward. So everything we do needs to go be seen through the lens of equity. How is this decision or this strategy or this goal going to impact um, our community at Dartmouth? How does it make Dartmouth more resilient or not? How does it impact our core mission? Uh, of education, how will we educate people about what we're doing? How will we communicate about what we're doing? And this last very important question of how will we actually make this thing happen? Right? That's critical. These are the working groups for those of you who haven't had a chance to revisit this in a while. One of, everyone is in one of these buckets or has been working in one of these buckets, but uh, you may not be f as familiar with the other working groups. And again, these distinctions, these like neat little lines on a slide are artificial, right? This is an ecosystem, and these are all connected. But for the purposes of decision making, we break them up. So um, we talked a little bit about this in our step, step ladder uh, chart. But this is another view of the same thing. We are here at the summit in the middle of this slide. And after this, once we present the principles to President Hanlon that come out of this, there will be a period from probably mid-March or April, 
through September where we are working on how do we actually do the stuff that's in here. Because if we have recommendations, strategies that have tactics underneath them that are unfunded, for example, or don't have a responsible person, we can't do them. So we need to consciously say, we're not going to do this thing until it's funded or it has a person who can be responsible for it. So that process is going to happen from um, March, April to August, September. Um, and that's, so when you're starting to feel nervous today of like, wait a second, we're setting a really ambitious goal. Recognize that the idea here is to set a North Star that we can aim ourselves at. And underneath that, we're going to have a whole lot of tactics. If we can't clearly identify who's going to be responsible for what, we're going to have to put that goal aside and say we can't commit to that goal right now. So I just want everyone to recognize that that is part of the process as well. We are in, right now, the sausage making, right? This today is about strategies and goals that are in process. Nothing is chiseled into stone. Nothing is uh, decided. This is, this is the part where we get to figure out exactly what we're going to do. So here's the disclaimer that goes with, along with that, right? Um, I also wanted to acknowledge, so some of you submitted feedback, um, working group feedback in the end of last week. We did not revise the goals based on that feedback. What we did is put that feedback on sheets to go alongside those goals so that it, it's visible. You'll see it when we move up into the project lab space. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to add to that feedback, to upvote it or downvote it, for example. Um, but today's feedback and working group feedback that was given at the end of the week last week will be incorporated into revisions moving forward. So if you wrote something and then you're looking at your goal and you're like, it didn't change, it's OK. The something you wrote is going to appear in summary, not verbatim, um, next to that working group goal. And you can continue to add feedback to it. Um, I think with that, I'm going to introduce Dallas Scott, who all of you, I think, I think everybody has met Dallas online. Um, Dallas and I have worked together for a long time. In fact, I hired Dallas in my previous incarnation, had an awesome interview with her, and I was like, I don't know what she's going to do, but we need her. Um, and Dallas has since gone on to become an accomplished facilitator. She's run many processes like this. Part of the reason we uh, brought Dallas to Dartmouth to help us facilitate this process is that we've worked with her extensively as part of the Ivy Plus Sustainability Consortium, where she's providing a um, sort of master planning uh, facilitation. And she's done a great job of hurting a lot of very cat-like cats through that process. So we knew if she could do that, she could definitely do this. So without further ado, I think I will turn it over to Dallas. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, and thank you all for everything you have done to date, for showing up to 90-minute Zoom meetings, for engaging with all of the um, Google Forms and providing comments and feedback, your investment in this process has allowed us to get to a fantastic set of draft goals and strategies. So I wanted to say thank you for your investment. Um, right now what we get to do is we get to have our working group chairs come down and provide their our high level drafts of our goals and strategies and some of their key learning and takeaways uh, from this process to date. So we get to start off with our community working group chair. Sarah, please, if you, we would love for you to come join us. And we will hand you a mic for your presentation. And feel free to introduce yourself a little further. For those who don't know, this is Dr. Sarah Crockett of the great class of 97. <laughs> Sarah and I were classmates. Yes. Um, I am so grateful to be here today. Briefly introduction, my name is Sarah Crockett. I am an emergency physician. Um, and my day job is to work with people who are in crisis, not necessarily always climate, but often related to social inequities, lack of access. Um, you know, so I'm kind of putting out little fires every day. And I really appreciated being part of this community root work group to look at what are some of the root causes of the unwellness that I'm seeing each day when I go to work. And I have taken this, I'm a, emergency doctor, a wilderness medicine specialist, so working a lot with Katie and outdoor programs and trying to bring wilderness as medicine to as many people on this campus as I can, but also recognizing that the wellness that we seek 
in our society is first and foremost needs to be wellness for our planet. And I cannot step away from human health without looking at planetary health. And that's why I am part of this working group, why I'm part of this effort, why I have helped to found the Alliance for Climate and Health at Dartmouth, and why I'm very excited to be launching the first health and climate um, dedicated class at TDI um, with some amazing co-teachers um, in just a few weeks. So this is very important to me, but I also want to make very clear I am just a representative voice. I was privileged to work with truly amazing members of our community, members of our um, local Abenaki indigenous community who have had a very important voice in this, members of our student community, members of people who are working in all different um, areas within the Dartmouth community and outside the Dartmouth community. And it's been an incredible experience to do just what Rosie talked about, think about what is our ideal community, what do we want wellness to look like for our campus, for our community, and for our broader society. So um, we are all privileged to be tied in some way to this anchor institution of Dartmouth College. And there are a lot of resources here. Um, we believe that as Dartmouth will use those resources, we can advance sustainability and equity. Those two are, are one and the same. As we work towards sustainable um, society, we work towards a more um, equitable society, and starting first and foremost with our local communities. So I won't read all of this to you, but these are some of our high-level goals and some of the, the things that we really want to begin focusing on, again, with this optimistic view to work towards the society we want to envision. So um, as with any ambitious project, we believe we need to start with a needs assessment. So what are the actual needs of our Upper Valley community? We need to formally assess those needs to guide the next steps of this process. Um, as we are thinking about you know, what is our role, again, as an anchor institution, um, we are first and foremost an uh, education institution. And so looking at academic learning, looking at re research, our co-curricular planning with, you know, the, the nation's first and foremost outing club that can show people just how important this planetary health is for our health. Um, looking at all of these ways that it comes together to provide wellness for our community. Um, and then it does come down to how we use these resources. So thinking about um, what does it mean to provide a living wage to the people who make this college run? Do we have housing that lets people live sustainably? Or do they all have to commute two hours because the cost of living here in Hanover is overwhelming and therefore we're burning a lot of fossil fuels just to let people come and make this campus run? Um, thinking about, again, how do we invest in the well-being of not just the students, but everyone who makes the student experience possible? And then finally, thinking again, these big picture concepts of equity, of not just our local community, but also the global community that we're seeking to create. Um, where do we invest our endowment? Are we investing in things that are actually harming our society that we're trying to, to create? Are we accountable for those investments? Are we thinking about our Abenaki community members who have never ceded this land and who are very much still a part of what's happening here today. Are we hearing their voices? Are we making them part of these conversations? All of these things making us more accountable. Um, I was listening to a wonderful book on the way in called All We Can Save, talking about the importance of getting the right people at the table, supporting feminist voices, BIPOC voices. Um, and this quote that stood with me is, the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. And when I heard that quote, I thought of President Hanlon's call to lead and what we at Dartmouth are trying to represent. And it is first and foremost a leadership issue to create the type of community that we hope to create. And so I'm grateful to be here with you doing exactly that. Um, so what have we learned in our discussions? First of all, I have learned that having everyone's voice at the table is so important. And what I learned from Grace as a student representative and what I learned from Paul and Denise as our Abenaki representatives, all of these voices are so essential. And what we came down to is we have to shift. We have to shift how we think about everything. We can't use the same metrics of success, of uh, wellness. We have to think about a community-based definition of what it means to be great and have the right voices weighing in as we create that vision. Um, 
So centering equity, getting the right people at the table, and then letting those people lead. It's not just about, okay, here we're tapping you know, each of the representatives, but to really listen to their perspective and to change ours is so important. We also recognize there's still so much, so many issues within our community that we haven't necessarily identified. Child care came up a lot. That was not on the top of my list when I set out to think about wellness and health for our community. Um, but again, access to um, a living wage, to child care, to housing, to transportation, all of these things come together to create the kind of community we want to come. And we still don't know everything that we need to focus on. Um, and so our takeaway message that we want you guys to think about when it comes to creating this better society that we're striving for is shift happens. And it's happening right now because you're here and you're listening and you're thinking and you're stepping outside of the worldview that may be the only way of thinking that you once were taught and now you're thinking broadly and many of you will go on to teach those broader visions and you will shift this entire culture of our campus and of our community in the Upper Valley and of our greater society because shift happens. Yay, thank you so much. I would like to invite John Sturman up as our chair for the Energy Working Group. Great. Thank you, Dallas. And uh, thanks. That was terrific and really set the stage for what we want to talk about in the Energy Working Group. But first, I want to thank everybody who participated and continues to participate in that Energy Working Group. Some of you are here. I'm not going to call people out by name, and I expect some who aren't here are online. But it's been a fantastic experience with tremendous commitment and participation from everybody. I also want to thank Phil. We were in the same class at Dartmouth. And um, what's so exciting about it is having established the first important set of sustainability goals, including emissions reductions, as the climate situation has gotten more dire, which it has, uh, leader steps up and says we've got to do better. And that increase in ambition is really important, and you're going to see it in what we're doing here. So I'm not going to read these. You can see them. But the most important one is that we are recommending that Dartmouth commit to zero scope one and scope two emissions by 2050 or before. And that would be consistent with the science on what's needed in order for us as a world to have any kind of decent chance at all of limiting the climate change to no more than two degrees C while striving for even better. And I think everybody here knows this, but two degrees C, 3.6 Fahrenheit, is not safe. It's just a whole lot better world than where we're going unless we take dramatic action. Things are going to get worse, but we can limit the damage and make a tremendous difference to everybody's lives. You'll see the milestones here. We can't wait until 2045 and say, okay, now we've got to do something. We have to start today due to the long life of the assets, the buildings, the infrastructure, the habits, the norms, and so forth. We have to start today. And so that's why you see these dramatic milestone goals here um, for reducing our scope one and scope two emissions. And we really need to do it even faster if we can. And the good news here, and maybe you could go to the next one. The good news here is that when we do this, it's going to be enormously positive in many, many dimensions. It's going to be building a more resilient, safer, healthier, equitable community, as Rosie and Sarah already mentioned, it's going to actually, in many cases, be financially wise. Many of the actions that we are recommending in our draft proposals are NPV positive when you take full account of the costs and the benefits that they provide. And uh, we recognize that reducing the campus emissions, although it is our duty to do so, as well as a great opportunity, isn't enough that the college is in a privileged position, and that means we need to help others here in the Upper Valley and beyond to reduce their emissions and realize the benefits of doing so that we expect to enjoy. We'll be reviewing these goals as we go forward, as should happen, and as is consistent with what Phil has uh, outlined in his leadership here. So here are some of the draft strategies. Uh, we, are co we recommend committing to reducing our campus-wide energy use intensity, that's 1,000 BTUs per square foot per year, from 145, which is what it is now, 
to 85 by 2030 and 40 by 2050. In other words, a dramatic acceleration in energy efficiency across the board for all the buildings and all the facilities. The good news here is that efficiency is the fastest, safest, cheapest way to cut our emissions while providing people with what they need and want, to be warm in the winter, cool in the summer, have lights when they need light, and access to good, meaningful jobs, opportunity, education, health care, and so forth. And it pays dividends. It's cheapest in part because when you cut the average and peak load of the campus, you then reduce the cost of providing the energy that we need from any source, especially renewable sources that we're advocating here as well. So uh, most organizations, including my own at MIT, where I've been on the faculty now for 42 years, um, we have found that when we make dramatic investments in energy efficiency for our facilities, the NPV of that is positive. That is, we've made money for the campus, our campus, and that is possible here too. Um, in order to do this, we've got to align the financial systems and processes with the sustainability goals, with the energy goals, and um, that's going to require some change. I don't know all the details of Dartmouth, but I know at my own institution, the way financial management is often done is to look at the costs and not adequately consider the benefits. So the most important thing that we're recommending here is that we switch to an integrated whole system design process for everything that we do here, which means taking full account of all the interconnections, as Rosie mentioned, across all of the what now appear to be different working group silos. You can't do any of them alone, and there's going to be important synergies when we recognize those connections. And then to take full account of the costs and benefits, including benefits that may seem intangible, like the ease of recruiting and retaining students, faculty, staff in a more comfortable, more resilient, healthier, more sustainable campus. And to do the same thing for our neighbors in the Upper Valley and beyond. So, uh, I think we can go on. You told me three minutes, I know I'm going over. So. <clears throat> so, these are drafts, and we're gonna be working on it upstairs, but we've already made a lot of progress, and a lot of that credit goes to Phil and his leadership, and Rosie, and everything that's been on it. And I think those of you who live around here, you all know what's already been done on energy efficiency with moving from steam to uh, medium and low temperature water distribution for heating. Um, we need to do a lot more, and it's possible, and it's almost certainly going to be financially quite attractive. Part of that is using a discount rate for evaluating projects that's consistent with the very low risk that those projects entail. When you do an energy efficiency upgrade, there's no market risk, there's no counterparty risk, there's no systemic risk of a global economic meltdown, and there's almost no technical risk. So you should use a discount rate for your analysis that's appropriately low, consistent with the very low risks of those activities. That's not happening right now. We need to have that taken into account. Still to come, as I mentioned, the integration with the other working groups and activities and helping folks uh, in the Upper Valley and beyond, and not just folks who live in cities like I do, well, suburbs, but um, people who live in the rural areas. I think the college is uniquely positioned to help the many people of limited means who are rural, who are scraping by, who are not able to take advantage of some of the programs and opportunities that those who live in bigger settlements and cities can. So our bumper sticker, net zero is net positive. What does that mean? It means when we strive for and achieve net zero, it's going to build a healthier, safer, more resilient, more enjoyable and more equitable world. It'll be net positive for everybody. Looking forward to working with you all later today and beyond. Thank you. John, thank you so much. Um, next, we have Laura coming uh, to present our food working group. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Laura Brash. I work with the Dartmouth Sustainability Office as an Assistant Director for Experiential Learning. Um, and in my role with the Sustainability Office, um, I, I focus a lot on our organic farm program, working with students to uh, teach them about 
sustainable agriculture and, um, and all the ways that uh, we are connected to our food system. So um, in working with, with the Food Working Group, it's, we've had a lot of amazing discussions um, around how Dartmouth and its role in the food system can, can work to support our climate goals. And food has a huge um, implication, and how we produce food has huge implications for our, our climate. And, um, and so we need to think as an institution about how we want to uh, be supporting the food system we would like to see. Um, and it's an interesting fact that almost 40% of food that gets produced in the United States uh, get, is wasted somewhere along the food chain. So we'd love to, to think about that a little bit um, and the, just the climate implications of that amount of waste um, within a system. So um, along the way in our discussions, we've, we've thought a lot about how, how, do we want, um, how do we want our food system to look um, and how will we support that. So Dartmouth will support and nourish regenerative sustainable food systems. This is our over, overarching goal, a guiding principle about about how we want to um, behave as eaters and, and you know, actors in our food system. So draft strategies that we have here that have come up are, um, we have three that have, that have emerged. And um, primarily, uh, the first one is about reducing externalities. So that's about waste in our food system. So we want to be reducing both pre and post consumer food waste. Um, as well as, as wa um, other waste associated, so packaging waste and things like that. Um, Dartmouth will also work to create a culture that values food. We, we recognize that... Hmm? Oh, sorry. Okay. Everyone hear me? Um, so another key element is about creating a culture that values food. So that's our students, faculty, staff, everyone here um, contributing to a culture that that thinks about our food cho choices intentionally and wants to contribute to um, you know, a positive shift in our food system to be more sustainable. So we need to do that in a number of ways, but um, primarily thinking about how do we, how do we kind of cultivate that, that culture shift um, and have our students understand the impact that the food they eat uh, has on ourselves and our communities and the environment. Uh, and then lastly, Dartmouth will increase the amount of food that is sourced sustainably Sorry, sustainably, um, which you know is it's a guiding principle, and it's something that we have yet to discuss more about how we can um, create the right trajectory for sustainable purchases. Because obviously, food purchasing is a very complex system, um, and our suppliers are changing rapidly. It's it's hard to keep things very transparent um, in terms of how we make decisions. So, uh, thinking about that as kind of a directional focus, like more sustainable and creating food purchasing standards that um, that support that type of directional purchasing decision making. So, some of our learnings to date. Um, I mean, we are at a college, and it's an educational institution. Um, and our product is our students. So we really want to work to create a culture that values food and teaches our students to be educated and thoughtful eaters. Um, this would be have huge implications for their, their entire lives of being, um, being eaters and players in our food system. So um, we really want to think about that culture change and, and how we uh, do this type of food education. Um, and Dartmouth has incredible resources to do that type of education, both you know, in our dining halls as well, but in the classroom, in the research we're doing, at the organic farm, um, all sorts of things. Uh, we also think a lot about, about food waste and food waste reduction and that how important this is to our climate, our climate action. Um, and reducing waste isn't just good for, for the environment, but it also pays dividends in terms of money saved, labor saved in, in you know, preparation and disposal, um, carbon footprint reduction. Uh, so it really does pay dividends and, um, and it can't be understated. Um, and then conscientious food purchases can help support a food production system that is just and regenerative. We've had a lot of really wonderful discussions around these terms, um, regenerative and how we use our food purchasing to support uh, you know, a landscape that is, that is actively regenerating and not just kind of like pulling resources from the environment. And um, agricultural soils have a huge capacity to be a carbon sink when farmed sustainably. So we want to think about, um, about regeneration as a, as a key criteria in the food that we're purchasing. Um, yeah. So we do also recognize that additional resources are going to be needed to support um, this type of vision for our food system. Um, 
you know, that's probably the same with every other working group as well. <laughs> but uh, so still to come, we are working on making these strategies more specific, more measurable. Um, so thinking about how can we how can we create benchmarks along the way? Uh, we are working on articulating the resources that will be needed uh, from the college to accomplish these changes. And we're also working on relationship building with producers and suppliers uh, to, to make these changes happen and get the information that we need to, to set those measurable goals. Um, and in summary, our bumper sticker is, we are what we eat. So yeah, you know, I'm sure I've seen that one on a car before. <laughs> it's a good one. It is a good one. <clears throat> Just to be clear, the bumper stickers we're talking about are electric vehicles and or bicycles, um, if in case you were wondering. So um, next up, we get to talk about landscape and ecology with Joanna Whitcomb. So thank you so much. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you. Um, I had the privilege of working with a great group of people on landscape and ecology, and even defining landscape and ecology, um, we spent a lot of time discussing, well, what does it, that exactly mean? Our overarching goal is that Dartmouth will love, leverage its landscapes and land holdings, which are quite extensive, to make sure that we have a sustainable and a thriving ecosystem. Our strategies are threefold that we, this, by one year from now, um, we want to have land management criteria drawing from best practices and good science to manage our landscapes and our lands. And um, we're talking, we talked a lot about making sure that we have this incredible resource um, of our lands. I mean, that's what makes Dartmouth Dartmouth is its, its beauty its landscape, its wildflowers, um, and use that um, to share with our students and the broader community the importance of our lens. And finally, um, making sure that we establish and utilize stewardship practices to protect these resources and to provide not only for now, but for future generations, that we should not be so arrogant as to make decisions now that preclude opportunities in the future. I'm gonna do mine in three minutes. Um, <laughs> our learnings to date, um, and I think this is really important, that Dartmouth is one of the largest, actually may be the largest private landowner in the state of New Hampshire. And with that comes responsibilities. Um, over 35,000 acres, and uh, as you know, um, we have 27,000 acres of trees and incredible landscape in this, at the Second College Grant, another 4,500, 4,600 at Moose Lock, and then around 6,000 acres here in the Upper Valley. Um, we learned that we need to balance how we use those lands and, and how we develop, how our plans for development, we have to balance what we do now with future uses, that we don't want to do something with our landscape that we will, our future, the future generations will regret. Um, carbon sequ we spent a lot of time talking about carbon sequestration. Um, our college forester has spent years talking about carbon sequestration and our students. Um, we realize that there's a lot of good science out there um, and we really need to understand how we should be managing for carbon sequestration. For example, it's important, perhaps it's what we should be doing with the second college grant, but perhaps not so much here on the 260 acre campus. You know, we may wanna densify our campus and make sure we're taking care of our trees and soils and wetlands on our, out our broader land holdings. We, like all of our co-working groups, um, feel that our landscapes are critically important for the health and wellness, not only of our Dartmouth community, but the broader Upper Valley. And the connectivity and um, being able to walk experience um, is really important and it's an obligation of Dartmouth as privileged as we are. We also learned that 
there's no one manager. <laughs> there's many people managing many different aspects of our landscape and our ecology, from OPO, from FONM, um, our, our colleagues at engineering and tech. Everyone has a role. We don't necessarily all have the same set of principles or guidelines or best practices um, still to come. We need to figure out what those best land management practices are. We want to get those managers and decision makers together to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to take care of our, our lands and our landscapes. Um, from reading from the same page, if you will. And we need more research and more quantitative understanding of carbon sequestration. And I had a really boring bumper sticker that said something like, from the green to the green way. Mm -hmm. And I ran into my fellow uh, <laughs> working group member and said, so what do you think our bumper sticker, sticker should be? What is good? And you can read that however you want to. So that's our, <laughs> right now. So he started the trend. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yay, thank you so much. All right, we are now have an opportunity to hear from Jenny, who is our chair of the transportation uh, working group. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm Jenny Chamberlain. I uh, teach in film and media. I think a lot about how we connect, how we communicate, and, and the infrastructure that we lay down to do that, and that overlaps with transportation in a shocking way, um, because it's just sort of fundamental to how we get around and how we connect with each other. We all felt this during the pandemic. Um, being able to like move is you know, fundamental to who we are as humans. And we've thought about this a lot. We thought about what an amazing opportunity we have with redesigning our transportation system to promote equity across all levels, to allow more people to move around and reach what they do and to do this basically not even necessarily spend more, but to do it smarter. Um, and the way we, we've done this is we've, we have planners, we have engineers, we have transportation directors, we have all these great people, we have students, um, former students who are still invested in this place um, have come together and they, everyone's had amazing ideas. Um, but part of what we wanted to think about is shifting this idea from alternative transportation to like what is fundamental what do what are the human needs and i was so happy to hear about wellness and community being centered i'm so happy to hear about returns on investment being centered and how we can do this in a way that really pays tremendous dividends in the future both for the community and the environment um, so this is a little messy still but the main idea is we're gonna look at the whole transportation system, which is vast, um, with the idea that we wanna minimize our carbon footprint in all of the embodied carbon in the transportation system. Um, this is so important because right here in New Hampshire, 50% of our greenhouse gases are from the transportation sector, 50%. So in the country, it's a little, little less than 30%. In New Hampshire, it's a little less than 50%. Most of that, single, occup single occupancy vehicles. That's kind of shocking. But if you look at like just basic mobility data, we're not that different from every other state. People take about four trips a day, and they do it um, not just going to and from work, but most trips, like 85% of the trips are getting food. Food is essential. Seeing people, social, social uh, activities are essential, right? So we're doing all the things that humans do, but maybe we can do it a little bit smarter. So that's, that's where we're coming at. Maybe we can optimize efficiencies of transit. Maybe we can um, build things closer together. Like I, if I have to have pizza every day, maybe I'll move into the apartment right above Vermonto's and save myself a lot of trouble. Okay, I think onward. Um, so we have some aggressive goals. Um, one of the things we realize right away that to make any movement, we start, we need, like, like these other groups, we need to do a needs-based assessment of what's going on right now. Who's going where, where they want to go, 
What mode are they taking? Um, there's a lot of needs. Like where do people need and want to go? And what barriers are in their way? Like should somebody have to time their biology experiment so that they can leave midday to move their middle schooler a half a mile to their sports practice? Or can we make it so that that middle schooler can just walk themselves over, right? Like what can we do that really like changes how we all live and benefits everyone? Um, so a lot, um, you guys can read these, right? A lot of what we're thinking about is what is convenient for people? What is comfortable? What's a barrier for individuals? Often you have to solve these problems for really specific individuals. Like um, I had a friend, she's uh, legally blind and she couldn't cross to her daycare. The only daycare, daycare is coming up a lot, um, the only daycare downtown that's walkable. And she ends up moving because this is such a recurring problem that she can't cross the street without knowing whether or not she's gonna get hit by a car, you know? That's a real problem. But if you solve that problem for that one individual, just like you know, back in the 60s when we finally decided to put in curb cuts, now suddenly anybody with a big push cart or a heavy delivery can get right up that ramp. So looking at these problems for individuals really helps us design a system that's better for everyone um, and smarter for everyone. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is changing policies so that we can build smarter, so we can run more transit with more frequency. And a lot of what we're talking about is not just immediately in Hanover, but connecting to the surrounding communities and then getting into some of those sticky problems of how do all the students get here? How do they get home? How do they go on trips? Um, how do we run our fleets? Um, what kind of conversion schedule makes sense? Um, there's a, a lot to consider with transportation. And so our learnings are that we need uh, a lot more data. <laughs> We do have a lot of engineers. We really want data. <laughs> um, but in thinking about that data, how can we align our goals with uh, ideas of equity and community? And how can we think beyond the tailpipe to how we're organizing everything? Um, and I'm really liking a lot of what we're talking about, developing systems systemically, thinking about how everybody's connected. Um, this is obviously incredibly important in a transportation network. Um, you know, your network is only, only as, as strong as your workest, li weakest link. If you have a, like a beautiful house off a main road, but no driveway, you can't get there, right? You can't get in and out of your house. And that goes double if you're walking with a walker with a tiny wheel on a, you know, a eroded sidewalk, right? Um, so what we, what we still have to come are we've, we have to refine our goals and strategies. We've been doing a lot of thinking about what data can we get on a regular basis so that we can make these actionable. That's a very tricky question. Um, we've been talking about big data solutions, local survey solutions, and how we're going to be implementing these um, and how we, can make them, how we can make these targets reachable and definable. Um, and our our bumper sticker right now is moving towards equity. Thank you so much. I'll pass it on to Marcus for the Waste and Materials Working Group. Great. Thanks, Alice. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcus Welker. I work in the Dartmouth Sustainability Office. Uh, I am the chair of the Waste and Materials Working Group. Uh, thank you to all the members who have put in the hard work. Uh, it's been a great process. Um, our Waste and Material Draft goal is that Dartmouth will leverage our purchasing materials and waste management and disposal to reduce environmental and social harms and maximize positive impacts. So I think a lot of what we have been thinking about is sort of this two, uh, two parts to the system, the things that we buy, the materials that we own and manage, and how do we manage for those things uh, when they are no longer needed on campus by individuals or by the campus as a whole, and how do we manage for those things uh, in the most sustainable way possible, and also how might we use all of the money that we spend and resources that we spend acquiring things to do uh, the most positive good uh, with, that, with that money that we spend. So, uh, 
four strategies that we have come up with uh, are that we're going to increase financial support for our materials and waste management system. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who I've spent a lot of time with over the last four years here at Dartmouth thinking about the waste system and our management of that system, and we really need more resources to uh, improve it. And so this is a really critical strategy. Uh, we also need to continue to develop additional strategies for redistributing, reusing, repurposing, and recycling materials in our community here and around the campus. Uh, we have some of these systems in place, but we need to really uh, strengthen those and build those systems out uh, because right now there's just only so much of the materials that we have here on campus that can be moved easily around campus to be repurposed. And then we have two strategies, it's sort of about communication and education. Again, kind of thinking about the mission. Uh, we need to really do a good job of communicating uh, correct waste management behaviors to our campus uh, occupants and visitors, student staff and faculty. Uh, and then we also need to think about kind of the other side of that, which is we need to really develop communication and education strategies for how we purchase things, what we purchase, how could all of us who are buying stuff all the time uh, for Dartmouth business, how could we help people understand what things to buy that are more sustainable? So what have we learned to date? Well, we've learned that, of course, all of the systems that I've been talking about are tightly linked, and the management of any one of them needs sort of this systems thinking in order to do it well. Uh, one of the unique things uh, about the waste and materials system that I think is similar to our food system and many of the others is just how that every person, every member of our community is contributing uh, to and has an impact on this system. And so it's really this education and communication component is going to be really vital to the success of our waste and material system. Uh, physical space is really critical, uh, particularly in the kind of reuse and repurposing components of our waste and material system, and we really need people to do this work. Reusing stuff and recycling things around campus uh, is something that Denise spends a lot of time doing and other members of our procurement division spend a lot of time doing, and we need more people to help with it because it's really, uh, it's really time intensive and labor intensive. One of the things that we really need to think about is how, um, how are we gonna help our community to do this, right? What are the incentives, policies, and practices, and education and communication strategies to help do this? Now, my bumper sticker is a lot longer um, because I couldn't come up with anything really, uh, really great uh, off the top of my head the other day. But Dartmouth's materials and waste management system needs additional leadership support, resources, and community engagement. No, seriously, we need to talk about this. It's a real challenge. And also, if you can read this, you're too close. The other thing that was thrown out today was unfunded and hard, which, which Rosie came up with. I you say in the car in front of me had a sign, a bumper sticker that said free and easy. And I was like, what is the waste version? <laughs> I was like, I think it's unfunded and hard. <laughs> thank you very much. Yay, thank you, Marcus. All right, last but not least, we have Eric from the Water Working Group. Hi folks, so I'm Eric Osterberg. I'm a professor in the Earth Science Department and I'm fortunate to be able to study water that falls from the sky, the rain and snow, and I like to work with community members uh, in my research. So this was really great to work with uh, a really engaged group of people who think about this from the uh, facilities, the FONM perspective, from the town of Hanover, the wastewater treatment and water resource perspective, and from like the ecological perspective. So you can see our water draft goal here, so we want to incorporate community needs. So talk with the community, engage with the community. This is K-12, this is engaged citizens, this is nonprofits, anybody who's interested in water, which is everybody, right? Everybody's interested in water. Science and best practices, right? Community, science, best practices. You can go to the next slide. So you can see our draft strategies here. In order to really understand the best strategies, we need better data. We've heard this over and over again. We need a really good baseline assessment of our water system, not just the water that we're using in our facilities, the water in, the wastewater out. We actually have some data about that, but we need a lot more data about our water systems in, in the natural world, our, our surface waters, our ground waters, not just here in the Upper Valley, but also in the second grant. So we need to understand all that, and then we want to reduce waste and harm, but not just reduce waste and harm, we also want to look for opportunities to actually create benefit, right? Not just 
reduce the bad, but actually promote uh, positive impacts on the water system. And then again, working with the community, engagement with the community, wherever possible, tear down this Dartmouth bubble and engage with people on this really critical topic of water. So next slide. So learnings to date, water is a precious resource, but is rarely treated as such. And this is not really meant as a critique of what we're currently doing as much as, as Rosie was saying, this is an opportunity to make real progress moving forward. Water is arguably, I think easy to argue, the most precious of our resources, right? And we are blessed here in the Upper Valley with a lot of it. We're not like in the Southwest of the United States or other parts of the world where we have to like conserve every drop. But it's the most precious uh, resource that we have and we can do a lot better than we've been doing. We don't have a lot of the data that we need. We have some data on like water in and wastewater out from the town of Hanover, but even trying to drill into that to figure out why certain facilities are using more water than others, we didn't have that kind of data. More importantly, we do not have a lot of data about our natural systems, right? What is the runoff that's going into our surface waters, our Girl Brook, our Mink Brook, the Connecticut River, and all of the surface water systems that are up in the second college grant, not to mention our groundwater. Um, and then this really provides an opportunity to engage with everybody because water is a universal connector, right? Kids are interested in water. Adults are interested in water. Everybody's interested in water. So this is a really good opportunity to, again, tear down this bubble and interact with people. Those strategies are, are really draft. Can't wait to work with all of you to improve those. And I guess our, our bumper sticker, the big green, is getting serious about the blue. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, one more round of applause to all of our presenters today and to all of you for helping shape these goals and strategies. I, um, I love getting the bumper stickers. I also think, you know, if a student in the audience that wants a nice uh, side business, um, you can get a couple of these bumper stickers out there. I'll purchase small them. Market, very small market. It's a small niche market, <laughs> huge potential. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're going to be doing um, now is we're going to be heading upstairs to the project lab for our gallery tour. If you're joining us remotely, thank you for your participation. There was an email that was sent out today, um, this morning, especially if you um, got snowed in. Um, and we are going to ask you to click the link that, to the Google form and you'll be able to engage that way. Before you go, I see everyone's getting ready. I just want to go through a couple of things with all of you. We have uh, Dartmouth's Our Green Future Communications student interns might be tapping you on the shoulder, asking. Green Future Communications interns. There we go. Woo! Might be tapping you on the shoulder, asking for you to be, take part in a mini interview. So that's going to take place. Um, when we go to our gallery tour, you're going to have 35 minutes um, to do a couple of things. Go around to all the different uh, working group posters. Add your feedback, your strengths and improvables, add comments, add connections that you're seeing between the groups, some suggestions. All of those are going to be incredibly helpful. If you think of a, a specific stakeholder who can help in the implementation of each of those strategies, write their names down. All of those things are going to be really important in that time frame that Rosie mentioned earlier on. Um, the, other thing, oops, the other thing that I wanted to mention is there's going to be some prompts around the room. So if, if there's an idea that you just want to upvote it, you can give it a green sticker just to say, hey, I like this. Um, there's going to be a pink dot if you have a concern. We recommend if you have a pink dot to uh, add your rationale as well um, on a sticky note. Um, but we also, you can, we have plenty of sticky notes and markers, so make sure to add your comments. If you want it to be traced back to you, also write your name and do your best to make it legible. So right now we have 10 minutes, a little bit of a bio break to go upstairs. What else is in that room? Grab some coffee, coffee, food, yeah. snacks. Um, so 10 minutes, and then I'm going to be setting up my computer up there. And when you see that countdown timer go, that's, that's your cue to, to um, start the, our gallery tour. Thank you very much. The project lab is if you go up the stairs and into the atrium, it's the glass walled room on the, the flat area of the atrium on the left hand side. That's where we're heading. All right, thank you all and our remote participants. Thanks for joining.